Live from KSAT 12, Good Morning San Antonio starts right now. Hi, good morning. It is Friday, February 23rd. Happy Friday. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we are enjoying this weather because, you know, Everybody gets something, you know, yesterday we got heat and this morning the cold weather. Yes, so lower humidity, very pleasant outside. And we're going to talk to RJ about traffic in a second, but it is the last weekend of the stock show and rodeo here in San Antonio, Justin. It's going to be perfect. The crowds are going to be there. I can guarantee you, but it is the perfect weekend to go out and check out the rodeo. Temperature is going to be really nice. The mornings will be cool. Afternoons will be warm. I uh, can't draw it up any better right now. As we look outside, we got blue skies and uh, temperature is sitting at 63 degrees, mostly sunny dew points low. So that dry air came in and we've got a north northeasterly wind at about 13 miles per hour. Today will be up around 76. The low humidity stays with us all through the day, mostly sunny skies. And as we look ahead, here's some of the headlines that we're watching. Uh, weekend warm, but nice. Uh, you'll see the cool mornings, as I said, but temperatures near 80 potentially by Sunday. More clouds next week, not a problem. Our next rain chance uh, probably shows up Wednesday into Thursday. And early March is looking a little more active. You know, the end of February has been really pretty quiet. Early March looks like we may get a little more activity here in Texas. We're going to talk all about that for you coming up and more on the eclipse too here in just a few minutes. But let's get over to RJ now. Hopefully it was a smooth Friday morning commute. Yeah, it hasn't been too bad, Justin. If you're about to head out right now, right now might be a good time to do so. It's Loop 410 Ingram North. You see a lot of the sun shining through, as Justin just mentioned. Our weather out there looking pretty good. Seeing a little bit more people on the roads right now than usual during our 9 o'clock hour. Do want to let you know about a couple of things. We have a crash being reported. Loop 410 northbound at Valley High Drive. So this is going to be affecting our traffic coming in from Ray Allison Boulevard all the way up to Loop 410 and 90. Let's go to the northwest side right now because we have a stalled vehicle being reported Loop 410 eastbound at Bandera Road. Not causing too many delays in, the, in that area right now, but something that we'll continue to keep an eye on. And south of downtown, still following this stalled vehicle here being reported, I-35 northbound at Division Avenue. There were a couple incidents there a little bit earlier, south cross to Division, but uh, it looks like traffic is moving through that area pretty well. So we are getting set for another round of these closures taking place on the far northwest side. So again, just kind of hold your breath. Keep your patience because we have got some interchanges here that are going to be shut down throughout the entire weekend. Starting tonight, 9 o'clock through Monday, 5 a.m. You kind of already know the drill. We are now going to be closing three clover leaves here in this area. Basically, they are the clover leaves that connect 1604 to I-10 in both directions. So we have a couple of detours here. You're going to have to detour La Cantera Parkway if you're coming in from eastbound traffic. And if you're coming in from the west side, you're going to have to detour over there. Tradesmen. Usually it's been Vance Jackson Road, but they've extended that out a little bit to uh, tradesmen and again traffic that's going to be going north and or at least uh, east and west on I-10 is going to be going up to the rim and coming back down on UTSA Boulevard and that's not the only bit of construction there we're also going to have Northwest Military Highway all the way to Blanco Road the eastbound lanes are going to be shut down there now fortunately that's just overnight into tomorrow at noon but this one again is going to be throughout the entire weekend so again just stay patient out there we know that uh, things are going to be very busy out in the far northwest side but again as far as our current traffic situation traffic looking good for the most part throughout the city mark and stephanie back to you guys thank you rj here's today's nine at nine a human smuggling operation bust on san antonio's southwest side yesterday led to three arrests and eight rescues the victims range in age from two years old to 59 years old the bear county sheriff's office got multiple tips for suspicious activity at a house on west south cross near south sarzamora some of the victims were injured, but most appeared to be in good health. Several law enforcement officers who responded to the Robb Elementary School shooting in Uvalde have been ordered to come before a special grand jury. Some of the officers subpoenaed are Texas State Troopers who will give in-person testimony next week. The grand jury cannot decide guilt or innocence, though. They can only decide if the case should go before a formal grand jury. It could be as many as six months before a formal recommendation is made. We now know the cause of death for an East Texas girl who disappeared last week on her way to school. The Harris County Medical Examiner says that Audrey Cunningham died from, quote, homicidal violence, including blunt head trauma. The body of the 11-year-old was found in the Trinity River this week after being missing for five days. Her death has been ruled a homicide. Family friend Don Stephen McDougal has been arrested and charged with capital murder. AT&T now blames the outage that hit its networks on a technical problem and not a cyber attack. 
The company says it was a software issue blaming an error in some of its code being used to help expand its network. The outage lasted for several hours yesterday, impacting thousands of customers. It's the last day before the Republican primary in South Carolina and candidates are making a final push to win voters. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley is hoping for a home state advantage, but former President Donald Trump has a commanding lead in state polls. Some of Trump's supporters say she should drop out, but Haley is vowing to keep going. Congress is facing another possible partial government shutdown. Last month, House Speaker Mike Johnson announced a deal to fund government at nearly $1.7 trillion. But the fight over where that money goes and what programs get funded has dragged on for weeks. Now, appropriators are working around the clock to reach a deal before the next government funding deadline on March 1st. If you've recently had a delay getting your prescription, it may be because of a cyber attack on United Health. The company says it was against its change healthcare business, which processes insurance prescriptions for thousands of pharmacies nationwide. The attack has been isolated and United Health is working to restore its systems. With mortgage rates falling, home sales jumped in January. The National Association of Realtors now says sales of previously owned homes were up more than 3% compared to December, despite near record high prices. The national median price is now topping $379,000. Starting next year, sales of gasoline blended with ethanol will be expanding in several Midwestern states. And that decision now official from the EPA. Right now, sales of E15 gasoline is restricted during the summer over environmental concerns. The corn-based ethanol industry has been fighting for year-round sales. And that's today's Nine at Night. And your morning headlines, the Alabama State Assembly is trying to put a hold on the state's Supreme Court ruling on embryos. And the trial surrounding the death on the set of the movie Rust continues. Plus, more school events requiring parents' permission and history in space. David Sears is here with your morning headlines. Yeah, this lunar landing on the moon is pretty exciting, especially since it's a private company that did it. So we'll have more on that for you in just a second. But let's start with this. You knew this was going to come. Controversy over the Alabama Supreme Court ruling frozen embryos are people. And now some lawmakers are trying to put a hold on that ruling. Now, in, in, in vitro fertilization clinics and doctors are reacting, saying the ruling is putting undue stress on patients. Two bills being introduced in the state house. One protects fertilization. The other puts the ruling on hold. As of now, the list of clinics that are holding off on treatments continues to grow in Alabama. The trial of Hannah Gutierrez Reed continues today. She's the woman who allegedly put a live round in the gun that was fired by actor Alec Baldwin on the movie set of Rust. The bullet killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins and wounded a producer. Gutierrez Reed has been charged with two counts of involuntary manslaughter and tampering with evidence. Prosecutors claim she was careless when it came to handling weapons on the set of the Western. She left guns and ammunition lying around and was generally sloppy and didn't make proper safety checks. While the defense claims she was overwhelmed and she's just being used as a scapegoat. By failing to make those vital safety checks, uh, the defendant acted, neg acted negligently and without due caution and that the decisions she made that day ultimately contributed to Ms. Hutchins' death. What really happened is production was negligent. They put her in the position of having two jobs, a props assistant and an armorer, and what you're seeing in this courtroom today is trying to blame it all on Hannah, the 24-year-old, because why? Because she's an easy target. She's the least powerful person on that set. Yeah, the defense has also tried to put the blame on Baldwin. He was the one handling the gun when it fired. Charges against Baldwin have been refiled, accusing the actor of involuntary manslaughter. He has pled not guilty. Extracurricular activities for students in Florida are getting a little tighter to attend. More and more students need parents to sign permission slips for the students to attend more and more events. Those include things like holiday parties, birthday parties in the classroom, and school concerts. For example, nearly 30 kids were not allowed to attend a school concert. Some teachers think it's over the top. However, there are parents who appreciate the fact that they know more about what is going on in their school. They're really draining the fun out of school, they're draining the enthusiasm out of school. It's, it's secure to know that the parents and the teachers both agree that it's okay for the children to do whatever they send home for. Yeah, those new communication rules come from the State Board of Education. 
History on the moon. Odie is now sitting upright and is sending data back to Earth after that historic lunar landing at the South Pole of the moon. The spaceship carrying Odie traveled 620,000 miles. It took a little over a week to get there. But when Odie hit the surface of the moon, it was the first U.S. spacecraft to land on the moon since 1972. No doubt Mission Control was over the moon with excitement. Today, for the first time in more than a half century, the U.S. has returned to the moon. I know this was a nail biter, but we are on the, on the surface. Yeah, okay, what made it a nail biter? Mission Control said the navigation system used to set the lander Odie on the moon just quit working. But a team of quick thinkers was able to rewrite the lander software and get control back and land it safely. Another historical note, Intuitive Machines is the first business to land a private spacecraft on the moon. But back to these quick things. I mean, so you got this program and this thing's going down. All of a sudden, whoops, navigation system's gone. Hey, can you guys rewrite the program real quick? Ah, no problem. No problem like, at man, all. Like, man, now that's... They're experts. Yeah. Their control room reminded me of our control room during breaking news. And at oh, the yeah. end, they go, that was a nail biter, but we're on the surface. We're on the surface. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's good stuff. We made it through. Good yep. job. David, thank you. All right, see you in a bit. Okay. Right now, 909, 64 degrees coming up on GMSA at 9. So more direct flights to popular destinations. San Antonio International Airport is expanding its list of nonstop flights and people are excited. We come back, Tiffany Huerta shows us what goes into getting these flights for us and what's coming next. Getting a, a flight say for example to Europe, it doesn't happen overnight. It's years in the making. And it's years in the making to, to keep those flights as well. And all that hard work is paying off for the team at San Antonio International Airport. Our airport is now offering more than 40 nonstop destinations and city leaders are looking to add more routes. Tiffany Huertas looks into the importance of air connectivity and what passengers would like to see more of. Uh, I'm going to visit some family. Jesse Lopez is traveling from San Antonio to Guadalajara, Mexico. As a frequent flyer, he wants to see more non-stop destinations. More direct flights to any destination, really. San Antonio International Airport offers more than 40 non-stop destinations, with the first non-stop flight to Europe starting in May. There's a lot of opportunities. Tim O'Crongley, Deputy Aviation Director for the City of San Antonio, explains what this new flight to Frankfurt means for our community. The economic benefit that you get from it, it's not only the direct benefit from the flight, but it's who will come here, what will be invested in the future, what will we take you know, to Europe. Uh, it, it's really a launching point for additional economic development for San Antonio and the region. O'Crongley says air connectivity is important for a community. The airport is a very large economic generator. And with today's mobile society, the way airports move people and traffic and goods, it's really a life hub of a community. What type of infrastructure are companies looking for at an airport? They, they want to make sure we have good connectivity, you know, routes and, and, and that kind of opportunities, but also other infrastructure you know terminals represent the community so they're the first thing you see when you arrive and last thing you see when you leave the airport was recently awarded 30 million dollars in grants from the federal aviation administration for upgrades to terminal a and for a new terminal that opens in 2028. This is the site of our future new terminal. O'Crongley says the new terminal will be added here, a 17-gate facility, approximately 850,000 square feet. More opportunity for new airlines, existing airlines to expand. Uh, we'll have concession programs. You know, they're all for local jobs. Last year, about 10.7 million passengers passed through San Antonio International Airport. And with this new project, they hope to exceed those numbers in the future. So we broke tra uh, passenger records and we look forward to continuing that trend. And that's why we're preparing the airport for the future based on those forecast demands and being able to serve our citizens. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Let's look out there with live cam. Glad to see that sun after a, a cool morning. I was already getting used to the humidity in the warm mornings, Justin. We're all over the place. Yeah, we are. We're bouncing around uh, pretty good here late February, but the humidity is gone and we're going to see a really, really nice Friday, really nice weekend. It'd be nice if we just go ahead and start the weekend now. That, that'd be a, that'd be good, uh, but we're almost there. 45 days away, by the way, until we get to the total solar eclipse. 
Uh, we've been passing along facts every day. We're going to give you a fact every single day until we get there because we're that excited about it. The moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, but 400 times closer. That's why when we have the total solar eclipse, it completely blocks out the sun. It really is. Uh, it's amazing how that works out perfectly, uh, but it just goes to show you that it's one of those events that you don't want to miss. I mean, everything's falling into place, right? And uh, yes, it, uh, it all, it's science. It, it all works out. And yes, uh, the total solar eclipse, 45 days away. So if you haven't made plans yet, you might want to go ahead and get started because there's a lot going on around the area. 76 degrees, that's what we're forecasting today. 74 Fair Oaks Ranch, 77 in Bandera, 77 in Hondo. It'll be another warm day, but not as warm as yesterday. We got up to 87 yesterday. Uh, so this is about a 10 degree drop. Uh, less humidity this afternoon too, so it'll feel pretty good. Uh, the dew point trend over the next six days, pretty dry today, pretty dry tomorrow. And then we'll start to see the humidity jump up some on Sunday. Still probably not too bad, but Monday and Tuesday, you'll start to notice the humidity a little bit more. We'll get into more of those warm, cloudy mornings uh, as uh, that humidity moves back in from the Gulf of Mexico. 63 right now. We've got a north northeasterly wind at 13, gusting to 23. Winds are a little breezy at the moment. They should die down a little bit later today. And I want to show you the pollen count because we have a long list. We're moving into tree pollen season. So ash, mulberry, elm, hackberry, all that. They're all low, so it's not a big, big deal. But I did want to give you the calendar here when you can expect uh, these allergens to peak. Ash typically peaks mid-March, and we've been seeing uh, quite a bit of that. Elm, uh, it's there. Uh, oak, that usually kicks in late March, early April. So we have some time uh, before we get there. And then you see pecan, that's late April. So the trees, it, it's... It's uh, pretty much right on schedule this year uh, for these trees to start kicking in uh, some of the pollen. Uh, if it's causing any problems, uh, yeah, the, the, we're seeing that in the list today. As we look out uh, across the country, there's not a lot going on. Other than you got some good rain across the East Coast, but uh, the whole western half of the country quiet. That includes here in Texas. And as we look down the line, uh, there are some storm systems that will be working west, east, across the country, just to our north. So we don't get any benefits uh, from these. But as we get into next week, uh, we've got kind of a double barrel system going on here. We've got one low that will work to our north. That will help to push a front through. That will make it uh, somewhat cooler. And then depending on which model you look at, we've got another little low that tries to work in Wednesday into Thursday. This could bring us some rain. I'm not too hopeful for significant rainfall. But it would bring some showers back into the forecast, I think, Wednesday and Thursday. And that's something we'll watch. So here it is in the extended forecast. 76 Saturday, 79 Sunday, 83 on Monday, 82 Tuesday. It does warm up quite a bit next week. We get more clouds. And then that next front uh, scheduled for Wednesday, will, it would cool us down. And yes, it would bring some rain back into the picture, which we do need at this point. Yeah, rain would be good for March. It would be. And it looks like early, early March is going to be a little more active than late February. So we'll just enjoy this weekend uh, because it will be very nice. All right, we will do that. Thank you, Justin. 19 minutes past the hour, 64 degrees. And if you missed our latest Know My Neighborhood episode last night, don't worry. We're going to share some of the main takeaways from the show when we come back. This Best of Mutton Busted, powered by your San Antonio area Chevy dealers. Anthony didn't play. I guess what I didn't realize, yeah. Steph, was is that that face guard on those helmets actually hold on a bunch of dirt once you go face down. Anyway, it is the final weekend of the San Antonio Stock Show and Road Year. Last chance to head out there is Sunday. You can find ticket information, parking details, and hours on ksat.com. The final performers at the rodeo will be Big and Rich with Gretchen Wilson tonight, William Beckman tomorrow afternoon, and then Mr. Clint Black coming up Saturday night.
Yeah, we have to protect those kiddos. Well, yesterday we featured our latest Know My Neighborhood episode about the Shearer Hills Ridgeview area. And if the name doesn't sound familiar to you, you will probably recognize some of the landmarks that make that neighborhood. This is the area around North Star Mall, the Almost Basin Sand Golf Course, the Migrant Center over on San Pedro, and the Rollercade. If you missed last night's episode, you can watch it again on our YouTube channel. But here are a few takeaways from the show. Shearer Hills was built during racially segregated times as specified by its developer, H.J. Shearer. In the records at the Bear County Clerk's Office, signed by Shearer was a racial covenant now barred by federal law. In the summer of 2022, Shearer Hills became the home of the Migrant Resource Center along San Pedro Road. The city opened the facility to help asylum seekers get to their final destinations. The vice president of the Shearer Hills Neighborhood Association says it took some getting used to at first. The problems would be sort of low-level problems, like at the beginning there was a problem with trash because this, when the city began the project, they just didn't have the operations in place. Um, but it's relatively very clean right now, and they're, they're doing a good job of cleaning up the trash. And while some residents are okay with the migrants in their neighborhood, others feel like their backyard has become the border. There has not been any negative experience that I've had with anybody who's going through the MRC. This is helping or hurting your neighborhood? Well, no question about it. It's, it's, a, it's a, a thumb on the neighborhood. The Shearer Hills Ridgeview neighborhood sits next to Almost Basin, and it's in the Almost Creek watershed, which means some homes are in a floodplain. That was never more evident than during the Memorial Day weekend floods in 2013. Homes went underwater, drivers had to be rescued, and it spurred a change to try to save the neighborhood from another devastating flood. I looked out my front window and just right there I saw a car perched against the telephone pole with a child like waving, like he might have been in middle school, waving out. Um, for help. After the flood, the city of San Antonio bought more than 30 homes along Barbara Drive and across the canal on Shannon Lee Street and demolished them to make this canal larger. Part of the Barbara Drive drainage project, that was phase one of the project. Phase two has also been completed, while phase three is funded but under design according to the city. It's been improved. So like the, and the, what the engineers have told me is that the, the water going down south of like where the where the channel is those houses there are protected but like further upstream you still have the problem many of the homes in the Shearer hills ridgeview neighborhood were built in the 50s and 60s back then the area was the suburbs and it took on a new fresh look something we now call mid-century modern that mid-mod design is one of the attractions to the neighborhood people had money uh, for the first time, a lot of people came back from the war, used the GI Bill, got education by the 1960s. They were up and running, and so their home really was their castle. These houses spoke of living a very different way, a much more casual, and a, a way that was somewhat nostalgic. On a, a rewatching of that story, you and I both remarked during it, we remember very well that flooding in May of 2013. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of people affected and a lot of people surprised because that hadn't happened to that level in that neighborhood before. And I remember water up to at least the bottom of 281 in kind of the Bassey Quarry area too back then. <laughs> yes, um, I remember uh, we, we did a, a live shot out there and I just couldn't believe that uh, where I was standing would, you know, normally you could drive through it. And here we are 10 years later, well over 10 years later. Those are just a few takeaways from last night's episode of Know My Neighborhood. To see the full show, scan the QR code with your phone, it will take you to the Know My Neighborhood section of ksat.com. you also find all our other neighborhoods we featured, and we have more in the works. You can also watch these on our YouTube channel. Well, right now it is 928, about 64 degrees. More ahead on GMSA at 9. So when we come back, we're going to speak with the executive director of the American Heart Association here in San Antonio about their Vestido Rojo event tomorrow and the importance of heart health for women. And it's also game day. Spurs came close to getting a win last night in Sacramento, but they couldn't hold on to the lead again. David and RJ have more as we get ready for the Lakers in L.A. tonight.
outside with live cam. For some of you, you're just starting the work day. For some of the rest of us, we're about to head home for the day. Woohoo! <laughs> we're jealous. Uh, some people are jealous. Yeah, because the weekend's already getting started, right, with this beautiful weather. Blue skies, it is so very, very nice out there. We're in the uh, mid 60s right now. We're going to warm up into the 70s today. Speaking of beautiful, I want to show you a picture here on KSAC Connect. Uh, this is the Nueces River Bridge. I'm not sure if this is the one along Highway 90, but regardless, that is cool. The frame, the sun like that, the, uh, uh, the uh, I think that's the sunrise. That is pretty awesome. Uh, we appreciate you sending that in, Gail. Great shot and happy Friday to you. As we look at the KSAC 12 hour forecast, noontime 72. We make our way up to 76 this afternoon. It's not as warm as yesterday, but Still pretty nice. Sunny skies and uh, northeasterly winds will be gusty this morning and then they'll lay down some uh, later this afternoon. Weekend. If you got weekend plans, all is well here too. 76 Saturday, 79 Sunday. Yeah, a little warm on Sunday, but uh, man, that's a picture perfect weekend for late February. Mostly sunny skies both days. What about rain chances? Well, they don't show up until next week, but we have put some in Wednesday into Thursday. We'll talk more about that storm system that could bring us some rain. And uh, beyond that as well, coming up in just a few minutes. Okay, thank you. Yesterday on GMS 8 and I, we brought you the story of a local woman who underwent open heart surgery and has since made it her mission to get the word out about heart disease. So we told you that Patricia Atti has been getting the word out about the signs and symptoms of serious problems like a stroke through the Vestido Rojo Conference, which is happening tomorrow morning. So joining us this morning to talk more about the Vestido Rojo Conference is Teresa Spies, the executive director of the American Heart Association. Good morning. Good morning. Well, Teresa, first of all, for people who are not familiar with Vestido Rojo, tell us about the conference and the purpose behind it. Sure, of course. So the American Heart Association is really getting behind women's heart health. And for the last two decades, we've had Go Red for Women, which is a movement throughout the nation focusing on awareness for women to think about their heart health. But here in San Antonio, immediately after Go Red started 20 years ago, um, we focused on local women's heart health, specifically Hispanic women. So Vestido Rojo is an event that is um, poss made possible by Go Red for Women, but it's focused here in San Antonio on heart health for Hispanic women specifically and the unique challenges that that population faces. Teresa, we know the goal is to get the word out about heart disease. Tell us the importance of that, especially for the signs of big problems like a stroke. Yes, absolutely. So one in three women will die of heart disease. Heart disease takes more the lives of more Americans than all cancers combined but only 45% of women are even aware of the dangers of heart disease and that these risks are even higher for Latina women, Hispanic women, black women. And so this is something that this conference, Vestido Rojo, tomorrow here in San Antonio is really going to specifically focus on making women aware of these risks. We wanna empower the 300 women that are here tomorrow to go out into our community and share this news with others. Yeah, speaking of that, what can participants expect this year at the conference? Yeah, so this conference is happening at the San Antonio Food Bank. We do have room for a few walk-ins tomorrow. If you show up at 8 a.m. at the San Antonio Food Bank Valera Engagement Center, we have a few more spaces for women to talk about women's heart health. We're going to talk about um, the relationship with eye health. We're going to talk about preeclampsia and what that can mean throughout your life stages. We're going to have a wonderful skit from some of our Vestido Rojo volunteers um, about their personal experience with their mother having a stroke. And then we're going to have a really fun um, Zumba activity to get people up and moving. So lots of activities. You say you had room for a few more walk-ins? Yes, we do. All right. Sounds good, Teresa. Well, well, thank you for joining us so much this morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Teresa. Have a great weekend and good luck with the uh, conference tomorrow. Thank you so much. All right, moving on this morning, let's talk game day. The Spurs returning from the All-Star break, taking on the Sacramento Kings last night. That's right. Well, the Spurs stayed close to one of the better teams in the West, but still fell short. So David and RJ are brack, brack, back <laughs> to break it all down. Back to break it all down. We're back yeah. to break it. Yeah. We're, we're breaking it. Yeah. Don't, don't break my back. <laughs> um, you lost one more opportunity to get your above 15 wins. 
Yeah, I, I know. I, w I was thinking about that. <laughs> we um, need a little yeah. counter. Every time we bring up this segment, we need a counter. <laughs> Just a reminder. Maybe like one of those old school like score counters. Typical Spurs game. Or one of the right. one of the like yeah. three ways that they play. Mm -hmm. They get down in the – usually it's like the third quarter is their mm -hmm. bugaboo, but last night it was the second quarter. They got down big in the second quarter, They and they come all the way back, mm -hmm. have a chance to pull it off. No. Nah. Yeah, and I no, I'm with you. Valiant efforts. I think yeah. that's going to be the story of this year's yeah. uh, San Antonio Spurs. And again, taking on one of the better teams here in the Western Conference, Sacramento, definitely in the playoff hunt at the moment right now. Devin Vassell, David. You know what? I, I think he saw our grades the other day. That's my guy. To, that's <laughs> my guy. Step up a little bit. 32 points, seven assists, mm. and one rebound. But 32 and seven, 13 of 18 from the field. Yeah. And three of four from three point range. Mm -hmm. And you remember when I used to say he was the best player? on the floor before <laughs> Wimby really got started. He was the best player on the floor last night for the Spurs until I know there was a little mishap at the end of the game. Right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Oops. so Devin Vassell did his part. He was on fire early on, keeping the guys in this. And this actually, Dave, was a very entertaining game from top to finish. Victor Wembanyama finished 19 points, 13 rebounds, five blocks. And yeah. I like the fact, David, that Victor went against one of the better big men in the West, yep. Demonte Sabonis, Arvita Sabonis' his son right there. But uh, and, and I like that he stepped up to the challenge here, hitting a big three-pointer late in this game. Yeah, but at the other end, Sabonis also had another triple-double. He's got like True. 19 triple-doubles. See, that's where Wimbenyama needs to be, hmm. triple-doubles all the time. And I'm glad you brought that up, Dave. Thank you. Because Pop did say that uh, Victor Wimbledon, that passing was going to be sort of the big thing that they're going to work on him post All Star break, making sure that he makes good decisions because they feel like he definitely can get to the level of a Sabonis or Nikola Jokic. Uh, I will say, David, look, I'm not a blame the refs guy, uh -oh. but I think we're going to get to this clip here where He's the Spurs were road. losing the lead. And is this, that's not a foul right there on Sabonis? Well, yeah, I get it. Sabonis is an all-star? Okay. Yeah, that's a big foul. We don't get the call there. Look no. what happens. We come yeah. back, alley for the Kings. Yeah. This game's over right that's then a, and there. That's a big call. That, so is Wemby going to get this call, David, later on? Uh, next year. He didn't even get a call to the all-star game this year, so he's not going to get that call this year. Aww. He'll start getting yeah. it next year and the year after. But, no, that was a foul. That was, that was, that was an obvious foul. But you're also okay. playing in Sacramento. True. So yep. You know what? I've noticed, just, just to go off on a tangent for a second, <laughs> Referees in all these sports are having having like a rough year. Mm -hmm. College basketball, NBA, yeah. the referees in the NFL. I mean, you know, they made all those calls. It's like Major League Baseball was having a tough time. It's like, do they not train these guys anymore? Do they not go? So, do they not like go over tape anymore and see? You know, yeah, how, how can I, we fix I, this? And all the players well, no. ever ask. If you ask a player, what's the most important thing you want to see from referees as a group? Consistency. Yeah. If you're going absolutely. to call it at that end, call it at this end. And I hate, well, he's not going to get that call. Is it a foul? Yes. Well, then he should get the call. Which a is foul what is a foul. about that play was that, yeah. for the most part, that I thought the refs did okay yesterday. But, again, to me, that was definitely a foul on Sabonis. He was moving his feet under Wimby. Yeah. We've seen a lot well, of different incidents like that where a player comes down on a person's feet. That was definitely should have been called. Unfortunately, I think it did cost them the game. But then again, the Spurs did give up a 9-0 run late in the mm -hmm. fourth quarter to uh, yeah, that doesn't help. cost themselves. So, but yeah, I, I I I don't understand it. Like just like in baseball, well he's got to paint the black. Well he's got a high strike zone. He's got a low strike. What does that mean? A strike zone is a strike zone. It's from the chest down to the knees. Come on, it's a foul. Is a foul. You beat the guy up. It's a foul. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This ticky yep. tack stuff at one end, and you know. But anyway, we get on that. And Talk about that forever. Uh, Lakers tonight, so now the Spurs back to back. They got all the break, had time to practice, and that showed last night that, that the practice sort of sort of paid off. But now they got back to backs against the Lakers. The Lakers are like ninth mm -hmm. in the West. So if we were like just doing eight teams in the playoffs like normal, yeah, I don't maybe, call this stuff normal. Like playing the stuff play not normal. <laughs> yeah, I don't call that normal. They wouldn't even make the playoffs right now. Yeah, they, they, they have been struggling, but usually Ooh. LeBron James, they kind of turn things on also post All-Star break. But like you said, David, I like what I saw from the Spurs. It looked yep. like they have been hitting the gym, definitely been practicing. And again, I think one big development here is what Pop said earlier, going to see a lot more passing play uh, creation from Wemby. I think that's going to be fun to watch the rest of the way. And you brought up earlier that earlier in the season, the Spurs played them back-to-back to the Lakers back-to-back. -back. It was like they played them twice. They had a game. They had a, a day off in between, but they won one of those. They ended up that, that long losing yeah, streak. They, they got to win against the Lakers to end that thing. So there's, <laughs> well, there's hope around the corner. There's always hope. There's always hope. <laughs>
go. Spurs 15 go. Wins, yes. right? 15 that was, wins. That was our it's number it's, 15 it's wins. It's going to happen, kind of. <laughs> Should have gotten 12 last night. Yeah. That was a bummer. All right. Okay, next time. All right, Steph, hang in there. You can stay up late tonight and watch the game, too. I can. It's mm -hmm. Friday. Woo yeah. I may chip in and help. Yes. There we go. Okay. See, there all you right. go. All We're the good vibes. Thank you, guys. Have a good weekend. 941, 65 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. When we come back, our Sarah Costa is going to tell us which seeds we can start planting now and which ones to wait on. A new Gardening with Cases story is after the break. Just about quarter till. Hopefully the really cold weather is behind us. So it might be a good time to think about getting seeds in the ground for this year's vegetable garden. In this segment of Gardening with Kset, our Sarah Costa shows us what seeds to sow now and what you can sow come March. love planting from seed. It's way more affordable and you can be more fruitful too because you can plant more. I'm not an expert when it comes to planting seeds so I'm checking in with Robin at Rainbow Garden. So Robin, what seeds can we sow now? Beets, carrots, turnips, and seed potatoes. And come early to mid-March, what can we plant? Green beans, cucumber, cantaloupe, and summer and winter squash. When it comes to spacing, what's your best advice? It depends on the plant, but do your research. Generally, we like to say a foot and a foot and a half between plants. Seed depth will make or break you. Robin suggests planting small seeds like carrots, greens, and lettuce only one fourth to half an inch deep. And large seeds like beans, corn, and squash, one to one and a half inches deep. Always read the back of the seed packet. They tell you exactly when and how to plant. We will plant some now at the KSAT Garden and some more come March. Happy gardening. I'm Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Sarah. Yay, it's Friday. Woohoo. Yay. <laughs> Everyone's excited, especially yeah. when the weather's like this. It just gets you in a good mood. Yeah, yeah so it should actually be a bigger clap than, than the yeah. little one we gave it. Not a golf clap. <laughs> Not a golf clap. Uh, roll the windows down. Turn the music up. It's the Yay. weekend almost, and it's, it's going to be that kind of weekend as far as the weather goes. Uh, I want to start with a graph showing you the average high temperature. So it is about this time of year where we start to kind of make that turn uh, where temperatures really do start to warm up. So we've made it through the coldest uh, months here. Obviously, January is our coldest. We average uh, right around 62 to start the year. And then once we get into March, we start to see those averages jump up to near 70. And then as we get into spring, uh, you know what happens from there. And we typically peak uh, there in uh, August and uh, near September. So uh, we are on the climb now and temperatures are warming up accordingly. Uh, 70 degrees at 11 o'clock, 72 noontime. We'll make our way up to about 76. Now, this is an improvement from yesterday. If you remember, we were up to 87 yesterday. It was warm. The air is dry. It'll be about 10 degrees cooler today. We have a northeasterly breeze. So, yeah, it feels really good out there. 69 at 7 o'clock, 66 at 8 p.m. Great for any Friday evening plans you may have. And as we go outside for you, a lot of blue skies, too, as we look out over the airport. Temperatures right now at 63 at the air, uh, airport, 65 New Braunfels, and you got low 60s in Seguin, Bernie, and Kerrville. Everyone's looking at a north northeasterly wind anywhere from about uh, 10 to 15 miles per hour. These winds will subside a little bit later this afternoon. Big picture here across the country. There is nothing, and I mean nothing, going on uh, for the southern half of the country other than uh, if you get down into parts of Georgia and Florida and then up and down the east coast. So that's a storm system that is exiting the east coast there. California is getting a chance to dry out. They've been getting pummeled by rain out there. So as we look at the future cast, uh, we still have sort of, uh, well, there's a ridge down in Mexico. It's kind of nudging up into Texas, and that's kept everything pretty quiet. But as we get into next week, we start to see a couple systems working in uh, to the west coast. Now, there's some disagreement with the models as to how this kind of plays out. But I think what happens, we get one northern system here that helps to push a front through. That gets us a little bit cooler Wednesday and Thursday. Then a trailing system behind that that would bring a small window for rain, I think, Wednesday into Thursday. And this is something we'll be top, uh, talking about next few days because I think the timing still could be changed a little bit. But that's the general idea, and that would uh, bring a rain chance maybe about 20% on Thursday. That's the hope. And as we look at the future cast precipitation over the next week, this takes us through Wednesday. Notice we're still dry, but as we get into Thursday, it does want to paint a little bit of rain down here. That would be good. We need some. It's been a while. Uh, we had a great start to the year with the rain, and then it's just kind of shut off again. Uh, we're at 7.59 for the year, 
and uh, we're about uh, 4.22 inches above average. So that's still really good, don't get me wrong, uh, but that departure from normal has been shrinking because we've gone uh, quite a while here without any significant rain. Uh, Del Rio certainly could use some rain. Austin's at 8.82. Uh, so as we look at the extended forecast, we'll go 76 tomorrow, 79 Sunday. Great, great weekend. 83 Monday, 82 Tuesday, more humidity. And then there's that front Wednesday. Should cool us down some. And I put in a 20% chance of rain on Thursday. But again, that's subject to change. So we get a little bit closer, we'll certainly iron out some of those details. It's kind of funny that March is going to start what officially what I guess about 40, the 40s? Yeah, I mean, the mornings are nice. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the afternoons will uh, be quite a bit warmer, though. All right, we'll yeah. be ready for it. Thank yep. you, Justin. Early voting is underway for the Texas primary election. The polls will be open until 6 o'clock this evening. Tomorrow they're open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And Sunday you can vote from noon to 6. You also have next week to vote early before Election Day on March 5th. So for a look at a sample ballot or a list of polling locations, you can just head over to kset.com. Now 10 till 10, 66 degrees. Look out there with Zoo Cam. Our friends, the Flamingos again, they're getting ready for all their visitors. We saw some traffic going into the zoo this morning. We understand there are a lot of field trips happening today. So Flamingos, have fun. A big screen reunion is happening this weekend and art is imitating life in a new movie. CNN's David Daniel explains in our morning entertainment news. Runway is a fashion magazine, so an interest in fashion is crucial. What makes you think I'm not interested in fashion? <laughs> Talk about a fashionable reunion. The Devil Wears Prada stars Emily Blunt, Anne Hathaway, and Meryl Streep are set to present an award together at this year's Screen Actors Guild Awards. The film did not win any SAG Awards back in 2007, a fact they may mention. The 30th annual SAG Awards stream live on Netflix this Saturday. I'm not comfortable with this. Well, you're going to have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Hillary Swank talks a lot more than Alan Richson in Ordinary Angels and apparently in real life. I know Hillary and she does a lot of talking. <laughs> I mean, she just yammers on and on. You learn to tune it out. No, but you know what's funny is remember when we have scenes where I have like a monologue, 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 and you'd go, uh-huh. And I'd then have a monologue, 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 and uh-huh. And I was like... She really had to do the heavy lifting. I was, but I was sure. like, wait, you're saying uh-huh, uh-huh. There were like three times when you said uh-huh. I'm like, but that doesn't help me figure out my next line. Can you like do <laughs> your uh-huh like this? Uh-huh. Like, and so that I know where right. my next lead-in is. Right, yeah. I was doing my part. Ordinary Angels is now in theaters. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. So we have some stuff to check out on KSET.com. Each month we're going to release a new Essay Vibes video across all our digital platforms and YouTube channel, showcasing a local musician performing live versions of their songs from the KSET Garden. Country folk artist Mikey Vibe kicked off the first episode, which you can watch right now. How about that? And then a UTSA grad student is making plans to set more records. Just last week, 24-year-old Ben Duong set a new world record for completing the fastest half marathon while dribbling a basketball. But he says he is not stopping there. He is running again in tomorrow's Diploma Dash 5K at UTSA, and he's looking to be among the top finishers in the Run the Alamo half marathon the following weekend. And this all ties into the Spurs. To read this story, head on over to KSAT. Dot com. I remember seeing oh that story goodness. last week. It's incredible. That is incredible. The half marathon, that course is not that easy. But I'm sure you could do it. Yeah. Have a good weekend. <laughs>